He's irreverent, inappropriate, cantankerous, curmudgeonly, filthy-mouthed, impatient, short-fused, ill-tempered, <laughs> explosive, overbearing, unwieldy, thoroughly impractical, inelegant, crude, difficult, unbounded, out of control, restless, always moving, relentless, stubborn, unyielding, difficult, really, really difficult. <laughs> He's a common thief, a con man, a flim flam artist, and a pain in the ass. <laughs> and he's my best friend. How you doing? My name is Mark Borowitz, and I'm the lunatic rabbi, also known as the holy thief. I was this, you know, suburban housewife with all the china and silver, but I was having affairs all over the place. I really helped my mother tremendously. I went places with her and all that kind of stuff. And then there was this other part of me that was just a criminal. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, at Mount Sinai Hospital on November the 1st, 1951. I'm the son of Jerry and Mildred Borowitz, the brother of Stuart Borowitz of blessed memory, Rabbi Neil Borowitz and Sherry Borowitz Linda. I'm also the father of Heather Garrett and the grandfather of Miles Stewart Garrett. I can remember being a little girl and my dad was at my neighbor's house and he was on his way home and it was, it was the next door neighbor. An hour later, he hadn't come home and we found him passed out in the bushes. I grew up in a, what was considered, I'm sure, a normal family in the 50s and 60s. My father went to work every day and my mother stayed home. My mother was active in the PTA. My father was also, you know, was active in our school life. My mother was uh, um, concerned about how I acted and things that I got into trouble for, etc. My father was more interested in my soul. Our dinner tables were loud and boisterous and argumentative. And I loved it. And we all had a voice. My father made sure all of us had a voice. That's one of the reasons I loved him so much. He was truly my best friend growing up. He got me. I was a lonely, only child. My mother was a first-generation American who wanted to raise me to get married and live happily ever after. My mother was a fierce woman. She was very um, controlled and controlling. She put a girdle on before breakfast every morning and I was terrified of her. My mother was pregnant and had a stillborn and fell bringing my galoshes to school because I had refused to wear them in the morning and they had been waxing the floors and she fell and delivered a stillborn son. And I think I was somehow blamed for that. Uh, had I worn my galoshes, she wouldn't have fallen and I might have had a brother. I think it probably had a very great impact on my life and my sense of guilt. I think I didn't want that brother because I think I was a very miserable and unhappy child. I cannot remember a moment of bliss. At 14 years old, my father died and I had to become an adult. My mother was a wreck. And my uncle looked at me and he said, um, as long as I'm alive, you'll never have to worry about anything. The most painful moment of my childhood was the death of my father when I was 14. My father was the person that I felt understood me and with whom I felt connection. He was the only one who laughed with me. And his death was very sudden. It was, um, we had gone 
to a concert together in New York, and we came home and uh, went to sleep. And I was uh, awakened in the middle of the night by um, his brother, his older brother, the judge, Uncle Harry, who said, your father just died. The week of Shiva was very difficult for me. I had people who's, who were my father's age, whose fathers were still alive, telling me that they, they knew exactly how I was feeling. I told them to go fuck themselves. They had no idea. It didn't make me popular. You have to grow up now, Harriet. Emotions are a luxury we do not allow ourselves. And that was the lesson of my father's death. And so I learned um, to contain my emotions, I guess, from that moment on. I am sure that my difficulty in sustaining relationships with men was probably related to the early loss of my father. My mother hadn't been able to afford dues one year. And I went to our original shul to go to uh, Yom Kippur to say Kaddish Yisker. The usher stops me and says, do you have a ticket? I said, no, I don't have a ticket. I came to say Kaddish for Yisker. He said, you don't have a ticket, you can't get in. I said, you know who the fuck I am. You knew my father. You were supposedly friends with him. You're not letting me in. He said, no, I, toy, I spit on him. I said, you should die, you motherfucker. And I didn't go to shul for many years after that. I had always known that I would be going to college. That's what you did, right? And particularly after my father died and his life insurance was paying for me to go to college, where I was expected to find a husband, uh, preferably a lawyer from Harvard. My mother preferred lawyers to doctors. She said that doctors kept very bad hours and they cheated on their wives. She said, you have four years to find a husband because after you graduate from college, it becomes increasingly difficult, Harriet, to find a suitable mate. So I found him after my sophomore year. I didn't want to, you know, blow that thing. And he was graduating from Harvard Law School. And his name was Jerry Rosenzweig. And I had two conditions. He was a Democrat and he liked classical music. My mother was working, she was making $2 an hour. Gross. The house payment was $150 a month. I couldn't make it. And after about a year, I went to the barber, our barber, and I said, I need a job or need something, I gotta help mom. He looked at me, he said, are you as good a salesman as your father? I said, well, I don't know if I'm as good, but I'm, I'm sure I could be. And he said, all right, come downstairs to the barbershop. And he was a fence for the mafia. So I would get all sorts of things on consignment. And I just started selling them. I'm making $300 a week when I'm 16, 17 years old, which was all the money in the world in those days. That was more than men were making supporting families. And I got into the life. Because I saw that people with money got respect, people without money didn't. I was living a double life. I lived a double life. The bad girl in me and um, the one who wanted to make my mother happy. There was one part of me that went to school and then there was this other part of me that was just a criminal and a drinker. I didn't fit anywhere. Several years ago, somebody wrote a story about me and called me the queen of the misfits, and I loved that. I, I'm, I'm proud to be a misfit, although it's painful. I snuck into bars when I was 16. I started going to bars. And I kept living this double life. I'd be in the bar, and then I'd show up for work. I'd be in the bar, show up for school. I did all of these uh, um, normal things all the while trying to hide my other life. I didn't hide it, but I thought I did. And I thought I was hip, slick, and cool. 
And there were a lot of people that just watched me go down. They tried to intervene. I couldn't hear them. I tried for a while to find something that defined me, an, an identity. I was looking for an identity. And I wanted to belong. I wanted to fit somewhere in a, in a profession, in a movement, in something. But I could never buy in 100%. It was an insane time. I did insane things. I'm a, a junior in college at a time at the University of Minnesota when Saul Bellow was my professor and John Berryman was my professor. And I fancied myself an intellectual. And I wanted to um, be wanted by them. But I was sleeping around with my professors. I didn't care about anybody else. All I cared about was mine. I did care about my mother and my sister. I shouldn't say anybody else. I kept giving my mother money so she would be okay, and I kept taking care of my sister. But anybody else was fair game. And it's not like I didn't love them. I didn't know what love was. I thought love was a feeling, not a responsibility. I had left Jerry Rosen's why I was living alone. It was right before graduation. And no one was coming to my graduation from college because my mother said, okay, Harriet, you unmade your bed, now you lie in it. And they took his side because I was a bad girl, because I was catting around. And so I began this um, love affair with John Berryman. I get a call from a very drunk John Berryman who said he would like to come over with a bottle of vodka and some tomato juice and read me his love songs. Wow, it was uh, my dream come true. I kept getting into trouble, getting out of trouble, getting into trouble, getting out of trouble. I had money one day and then I was broke the next. I was hustling hot merchandise in 1977. Kind of crashed down on me. I called my brother, my oldest brother, who was living out in California. He had just been diagnosed with MS. And I came out here to help him. And I was going to get a new start. My first job when I graduated from college, I was working for the Girl Scouts of America, wearing a green uniform, sleeping with John Berryman, and, you know, in his drunken stupors. And I thought that was cool, actually that I could pass, I could look good on the outside, and nobody knew my secret life. And I lived that way for a long time until those lives collided. September 5th of 1980, my daughter Heather was born. One of the greatest days of my life. My father was in and out of prison until I was eight years old. So I have early memories of my father being in prison, my father going on the run, and I felt empty. I felt abandoned and I felt alone. And I felt like my dad was, pardon the expression, my partner in crime and he left me. From the time Heather was born until 1984, I did a month in the county jail, then I did a couple months in the Met County jail. And all the time I'm working, selling cars and hustling. In Italy, we're fucking every Italian that we can find <laughs> and feeling very desirable. Italian men were my type. Yeah, more than the Jewish boys. And I was going to marry one. And then I found Michelangelo Alessandro Rosetto on a bus and came back to New York and married Rosetto. And lo and behold, he was the only impotent Italian probably on the planet. <laughs> and so we did manage to somehow impregnate me. And we had a daughter. And again, uh, our love life was not what I wanted it to be. And there was an elevator man named Bobby Green, who one day knocked on my door and he said, um, I smell this weed coming out of your apartment. I wonder if you'd be interested in sharing a joint with me. 
And I said, I certainly would. Because I was a stay-at-home mother. I was bored to death. I did not enjoy uh, parenting. And I started an affair with the elevator man. I was a very dirty girl. <laughs> it was very exciting. And he was black. And it was Martin Luther King had just been shot. And I was proving my, you know, integrated self. The elevator man, uh, again, was very potent, and the sex was great. Um, and he carried a gun, which kind of turned me on. I thought that was pretty sexy. I moved him in. That, that was a nightmarish time. Bobby Green was chasing me up 72nd Street with a broken beer bottle saying, I'll kill you, you fucking bitch. And I, and I had to leave New York with my kid and the dog. I moved to California. I didn't like pot, I didn't like pills, I love booze. I'm a drunk. People would ask me um, in later years, was I an alcoholic, was I addicted to alcohol at that time? I don't know at what point I was addicted to alcohol. I know I'm an alcoholic. Well, I think I was a love addict. Uh, I conflated love with desire and with sex and with attention. I think it was an attention whore. It was insane. And I never saw the insanity of it. I normalized it for myself. I met this, this woman, Linda, and, you know, I didn't think much of it. I wasn't looking for a girlfriend or anything at that time, so, you know, I was just fucking around. She wanted to get married. She was uh, divorced and had a child. And so um, I said, let's go get married. And then I got convicted. I had to pay restitution, and I didn't want to pay all the money, and the um, probation officer was pushing me, so I wrote a bad check to probation. I mean, I'm like a sick fuck with bad checks. So um, I got a three-year prison sentence. When I got out, I promised Heather I would not go back. I could not um, in any way rectify the person that I knew. I couldn't reconcile that with someone who was um, a criminal. Like that just didn't add up in my brain. I felt tremendous guilt and shame that I couldn't give my child what she wanted. She was constantly grasping for my attention and we were emotionally incompatible. I had no job and I had no money and I had no place to live. And I thought it was time for me to end it all and I seriously considered killing myself. The reason I didn't up until that point was um, a, a pediatrician that I took my daughter to who one January had said to me, you know, Harriet, the only unforgivable thing a parent can do to a child is to kill themselves. And what I did to Heather, I told the person I loved the most in the world at that moment that she wasn't worth me hanging around. I broke her trust. My definition of spiritual rape, breaking the trust of someone who needs to trust you. When I was eight years old, um, it was actually his birthday he paroled for the last time in 1988, um, November 1st. And I remember one of the first things that he expressed was that he had found God, and that was a little confusing to an eight-year-old because I didn't know why God was in prison. Um, and I wasn't sure that, that this was real. I got out in 85 and I just went right back into it. Kept hustling cars, um, stealing, selling hot merchandise. I didn't care who I fucked over. The cops started to look for me. And I realized I had to split. I told Heather that I had to leave because the cops were looking for me. And she looked at me and she said, Daddy, you lied. 
It got to the point to where I was drinking about a gallon of whiskey a day. I'm walking across the street. A white Ford Fairmount turns the corner, stops. Guy calls out my name, Mark. I look up. Guy gets out of the car and arrests me. I called my brother, Neil, and he, I said, I'm in, I'm in jail. And he said, thank God. The man upstairs is trying to tell me something, and I have to sit here till I can figure it out. I had a friend, and she said, before you kill yourself, go see this woman named Janet Levy, and she, she works miracles. And I went to see her, and um, she said, what is it that you want, my dear? And I said, I don't know, that's my problem. What I want is I want to know what I want. And she said, do you pray? I said, no, I don't pray, lady. I'm an intellectual Jew, we don't pray. And she said, I'm going to pray for you. That's it. You just pay attention. And when the want ads came out that Sunday, I said to myself, well, maybe I should see what social work has to offer. And there was this little ad on the page. And it said, person of Jewish background and culture to work with Jewish criminal offenders, master of social work required. And it was like, oh my God, this shit works. Who better in the universe to work with Jewish criminal offenders than me? Nice Jewish girl who liked bad boys. I went to prison. And I started to study and pray. And I saw myself in every chapter of, of the Bible. And when it came to the Garden of Eden story, and God calls Ayeka, where are you? And Adam says he hid. I was sitting in a cell crying, wailing, because I realized how many times God had said, where are you? I got a letter from Heather. Dear Daddy, I hate you. You are a part of me. So when you are in jail, a part of me is in jail. I didn't do anything to be in jail. Between those two, that letter and Ayeka, I could not contain myself anymore. And I really, I had made a commitment to try and figure out what God was telling me, and I solidified it that day. When you feel that you have been called, I guess you, pro you project a certain amount of um, confidence, and so I got hired to be the Jewish jail lady, to go out visiting Jewish men and women in jails and prisons. And I was hooked from day one. I was excited to be alive. I looked forward every day to going to jail. I knew that I was making a difference. I would get visited by a, a woman from the Jewish Committee for Personal Service. This ad that I saw, where I felt I had been called, was uh, a very... Um, interesting organization called the Jewish Committee for Personal Service in State Prisons and Mental Hospitals. And because there were so few of them, there was not a full-time Jewish chaplain. And so they formed this organization of five uh, social workers, Jewish jail ladies, who would go up and down the, the state and visit uh, in county, state, and federal penal institutions and look for Jews. We were Jew finders. She shows up with this um, coat with these big shoulders. I said to her, may I call you Harriet? That's my name. I mean, she just started out as miserable and as snobbish and as snotty as she could. I get a call from the rabbi at Chino State Prison. I went to the prison, and there was a circle of his congregants, and he introduces me to Mark Borovitz, his inmate clerk, 
who will ask the questions of me about this place they heard about called Beit Shuva, where uh, inmates could come when they were released from incarceration. Beit Shuva is a long-term residential recovery community. I don't like to call it a rehab because that's a, a connotation that there's something pathological. I think it's a place where people who are seeking connection and community find it and find themselves and realize that they can be their whole selves. They can bring their brokenness and find acceptance. She was um, not nice. I was scared and shy. You were scared and, you know, you weren't. And you called me a bleeding heart liberal. You were bitchy and miserable. And um, so that was the first impression. And um, I tried very hard to, you know, engage with her and cajole her. And she just kept thinking um, that I was uh, lower than dog meat. I hated him. I thought he was arrogant and abrasive and, um, and a, and a know-it-all and that there was absolutely no way that I was ever going to have anything to do with this person again. So I got pissed off and I got defensive and I came on a mission of mercy. I did not expect to be attacked. I expected to be welcomed. And I said, hey, listen, smart ass, I'm out there doing this. You're in here and I'm out there. When you, if you're so smart, when you get out. Come help me. And one day the man showed up. So I went to Beit Shuva and I said, remember me? Yeah. Well, he told me, if I'm so smart, come and help you, I'm here to help. I don't know which one of us was more surprised, there either me. He's there to help and, and we become friends. I believed in the mission of Beit Shuva. I believed in it greatly. And I knew that I wanted to dedicate myself to something greater than me. And I am not gonna take him home. I'm not gonna fuck him. I'm not gonna ruin this like I've ruined every other relationship. I'm not moving him in. Um, we're just going to work together and we, we have a shared mission. We both fell in love with what Beit Shuva could be even before we fell in love with each other. I wrote a grant uh, for a shelter, a homeless shelter for Jewish men and women coming out of jails and prisons and got a one-time grant to buy an old house in downtown LA. And we bought this old house at 216 South Lake Street. And in my readings, I found there was this concept called teshuva which is in essence a Jewish 12-step idea. It's about making amends and admitting what you did wrong. What a name for the place. The house of repentance, the house of return. And I named it Beit Shuva. I was meeting people who did terrible things that I really liked. I liked these people. An Orthodox man who was in jail for having sex with his young daughter. That was the mirror for me, that, that people had this dual, double life. Um, and, and they had good intentions, but they had terrible actions. In the first week, three guys came. And I was sleeping in my office, and I got up in the morning and all my jewelry was gone. And then they uh, helped me look for it. So that's the definition of an addict, you know, somebody who steals your shit and then they help you look for it. They discovered a method for reaching people. And what was so valuable to me as a rabbi in the community and as their friend, of course, was that the method wasn't just for reaching criminals and prostitutes and addicts and people whose lives were so severely broken, that there was a message in that for the rest of us about who we have to be in the world to live lives of decency. And that's what they developed at Lake Street when Beit Shuva was brand new, and that's what they brought to the Beit Shuva that exists today, and that's what they've gone all across the world teaching. Beit Shuva became my, uh, my addiction, you know? I think if I had been in a relationship, there wouldn't have been a Beit Shuva. 
that because I was not indulging in my sex and love addiction and I had found a mission that fulfilled that need more than any relationship ever had, that all my energy went into the creation and maintenance of Beit Shuba. Oh, with the help of Beit Shuba, I kind of found strength in myself and uh, just recently got into a master's program. I'm a former gang member who got a new gang of family. <laughs> you guys showered me with so much love, it scared the crap out of me. There is nothing more moving than to witness the transformation of the human spirit. And that became my sort of mantra. A lot of people don't realize how fierce Harriet is. Because when she wants something, she's like a dog with a bone. Harriet brought a spirit. She brought a vision. Over all these years, um, up until recently, Harriet had an idea and I had to operationalize it. And she had a lot of ideas. In the early days at Beit Shuba, first he, I hired him to run our thrift store. I was trying to start a thrift store. I thought he'd be good at that since he was a hustler. And then my secretary quit, and then I hired him to be my secretary. He was my secretary in the beginning. But he was passionate about Jewish learning and Torah, so he started teaching Torah to the residents of Beit Shuba. And he was acting as the rabbi, although uh, he was not yet an, an ordained rabbi. In summer of 1991, I had heard about a guy who had gotten out of jail and was spending his days taking care of people who had gotten into trouble. And I heard that he was a wonderful teacher. So I invited him up to camp. I put 130 teenagers into a room. They sat on the floor for three hours and he kept them spellbound. Rabbi Mark spoke to these kids about how much they mattered, how much they had a possibilities in the world that they couldn't begin to realize. I just watched this guy reach these kids with such power. And the kids were talking to me, they were asking me questions, and after I got done, they were crowded around me, and he said, I want to get to know you. I watched him grow as a human being and as a wonderful, wonderful leader and teacher. And then the American Jewish University, which is very close to here, opened a program in 1996 where a person could study to become a rabbi. And I said, why don't you go be a rabbi? It was a long shot. Who the hell was gonna take a chance on an ex-con, you know, in a new rabbinic school? He applied and, one, and we were waiting for an answer and one day he called me from our house. I got the letter from you, Jay. And she said, what's it say? I said, I don't know, I didn't open it. She screams, open it! All I read on it was Mazel Tov. And I said, I got in. I called my childhood home to tell my father. I realized what I was doing, I hung up the phone. And I just, I started to cry. And then I drove down to, to Beit Shuva and um, everybody was standing outside. They lined the steps and there was a banner. I can still feel the chills of that moment because it wasn't just that Mark had gotten into rabbinic school. All of us outcasts and misfits and ex-cons had somehow been accepted by the Jewish community. Rabbi Artson, the holy thief of Beit Shuvah. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Brooklyn. I was born in LA. I was born in a place called Wigan, England. I was born in Orange County. I grew up in Beverly Hills. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was born and raised in Calabasas. I was adopted at birth, so I grew up being told, be careful, you have an addictive personality. I had a pretty good upbringing. Mom and dad have been happily married. I had a pretty good childhood. I grew up in a Jewish family. We had a normal childhood. I played Little League and AYSO. My uh, mother's house was shot up with my family inside. 
kind of lost myself in, in, uh, in that process of growing up and trying to mature, become an adult. When I was eight years old, my dad passed away and that basically started a trajectory of me not knowing how to show my feelings. I was drinking almost one gallon a day of vodka. When I was 12, I began to drink and use drugs. I was a uh, raging drug addict and alcoholic. High school, I started smoking weed and drinking, and I just kind of started doing more and more drugs, and I finally went to my first rehab at 18. I used to rob drug dealers for a living. My body was, um, it literally felt like it was shutting down and I couldn't go more than two hours without like violent tremors. By the time I was 18, um, you know, I was a full-fledged addict alcoholic. The biggest lie my ever, parents ever told me was the dinner table. I don't care what you be when you grow up. I just want you to be happy. And I internalized that as you were supposed to feel good all the time. I had uh, about seven, eight years of uh, some intense drug use. Things that I enjoy to do, uh, I want to do them all the time. And a lot of times in excess. When my parents did get divorced, it was so painful for me. I couldn't cope with it. I was in a, about a two, two and a half year meth psychosis. Um, I thought people were following me. I was super paranoid. I was hearing voices. And my sister came and got me and brought me to Beit Shuva. Beit Shuva was like no other rehab experience I, I had uh, encountered before. The founders had a story uh, similar to uh, others that may have been incarcerated. The breadth and the scope of what they do for a single individual and their family is just, it's like nothing I've ever seen. It gave me a, an understanding of humanity more than anything else. And I relapsed and Beit Shiva didn't throw me away. When we've lost everything and we're trying to restart and trying to gain a new understanding of who we are as people and trying to quit eight substances at once like I was when I came into Beit Shiva, you have to start from zero. I just celebrated 16 years. Nine months. Three plus years. Seven months. A year and a half. Eight and a half years sober. Two and a half years. Nine and a half years. Four years, three months. A year and eight months. I have a year and five months sober. A year and seven months. <laughs> Ten years. Almost eight months now. Two and a half weeks. Two years and two months. Three years and two months. Last night. In the um, 90s, the recidivism rate was... 80, 90 percent. And in the prison system, there's no rehabilitation. And the truth is that over the years, Beit Shuba has about a 35 percent recidivism rate. 65 percent of the people stay clean and sober for five years or more. People began to find us who were in trouble. And I would ride up on my white horse and rescue them and go to court. I would say that the Beit Shuva community is probably the most diverse community anywhere on this planet. It's a place where um, just because you're ex doesn't pigeonhole you. That the need for this kind of help and healing transcends differences in a way that I've never seen anywhere else. When I, when I started Beit Shuva, I learned this idea in Judaism that to save one's soul, it is as if you have saved the whole world, even if it's your own soul. And I knew that the numbers um, in addiction were, were not in my favor, you know, that the recidivism rate and, and relapse rate was great, but that to save one's soul made it all worthwhile. If you're I am... Sick. It's because an irreverent your rabbi. Fault. God doesn't love you anymore. Bullshit! I'm more a prophet than a rabbi, as my friend and teacher Ed Feinstein said. We are not powerless. We are not voiceless. And, we and my Torah is a street Torah. I talk about how to live it in the street, in real life, in real time. And we have to say, we are for something, and that is equality. And that's what people in recovery or 
trying to be in recovery need. They need to know that what they're getting is not some, oh, I'm on top of the mountain and I'm going to talk down to you poor souls that are there at the bottom or in the well. No, man, we're all in this well and together we can lift each other up. So I go down and I make it, I speak in a way people can hear. And that's what makes Beit Shuba work for all these years. That's my secret sauce. When I call somebody a motherfucker, it's because they know it's a term of endearment. He has a quality. He can see through people. He's got a superpower. He can see when you're lying. He can see when you're faking it. He can see when you're hiding something. He can see when you're not telling the truth. That makes him slightly outside of the realm of the polite and the proper and the well-kept. The first time I saw uh, Mark conduct a service, I, I, I was shocked because the F-bomb was going off, you know, often. Fuck, fuck you, fuck motherfucker, a motherfucker. I'll rip your head off and shit down your neck. Fuck you. And I thought, wow, he is odd. The whole thing with Beit Shuba is, we believe that you build the box around the human being. You don't try and fit a human being into a box, which is our belief that everybody belongs. In early recovery, you're not supposed to have relationships according to some rule. Nobody knows where that rule is, but that's what they talk about in AA. We have a group of people who are newly sober and they're picking up from when they started to use. So basically, uh, there was 140 teenagers with raging hormones. The idea that they wouldn't be fucking was ridiculous. And they found all sorts of hiding places, laundry room and this closet and this bathroom. It, it was insane. So Harriet said, okay, if you're going to have a relationship, you have to get it sanctioned. Before you can fuck, you have to come and talk to me about why you're fucking and what it means. And so Harriet ran relationship counseling and she ran a relationship group. There are a lot of people who are married who have children only because they learned how to have a healthy relationship at Beit Shuba. I figured out at some point that if you stay sober, you give up drugs and alcohol, but you don't have anything else that feeds your soul or, or gives you a passion and a reason to live, you're not gonna stay sober. And so we changed our tagline to recover your passion, discover your purpose. So one of the things about Beit Shuba is if you have an idea and it's gonna help you and somebody else be in recovery and, and stay in recovery, we'll make it happen. Glenn Goss wanted to put together um, a recording studio. So we found the money and built a recording studio. We have a catalog of, uh, of songs. We have a theater company. We have Holla Baking now. We pretty much have gone with, if somebody has a passion for it, let's figure out how to operationalize it. Harry talks about feeling like a misfit, so she built a place where all the misfits could fit. But we don't even want misfits to fit, we want them to belong. Because when you belong, it's your whole person that's there. Because you showed up today, everybody's life is better. And Mark's tagline is, you matter. You matter. Everybody matters. And it's this sense of making sure that, that I live that way. Which is why we do tshuva groups every week, so people can see how they help somebody and how they harm somebody. Chuba group is, we're supposed to do Chuba one day before you die, and since none of us know the day of our death, we should do it every day. Yeah. And we have immersions, and we have do spiritual counseling training program to train spiritual counselors. We have our partners in prevention under that. It goes out and speaks to schools and to teenagers and to camps and to synagogues. We're one of the few programs that has a spiritual counselor, a um, addiction counselor, and a therapist for every client. 
Mark started the idea of themed Shabbats, where they would set the liturgy to different kinds of music, like jazz, Frank Sinatra, Motown, Motown, Beatles, Beatles. Shabbat. Rolling Stone, Shabbat, Reggae, and, and they could do it all. Right. We have gone all over the country with this play called Freedom Song that puts together a Passover Seder and an AA meeting. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Freedom Song, but it's a musical that we bring to other Jewish communities to shed light on. Um, addiction and, and start hard conversations that we think are necessary for people. When we try to teach the psychiatrists that just prescribing a pill or medication assisted treatment is not the answer to addiction and medication assisted treatment is only addressing the symptom the drugs or the alcohol the disease is the underlying disconnection between parts of self lack of meaning and purpose that requires recovery the disease of addiction is a disease of disconnection of the parts of self the inner contradictions that all humans have, whatever you want to call them. There's something about Harriet that she's able to tap into each individual that comes before her in some way and know what they need. One of the exciting things about working with Rabbi Mark is he's down for anything if it'll save a life. And he also has this, you know, kind of street, in-your-face kind of way. Um, and really, he's charismatic. I mean, in his other life, you know, he was a, he was a car salesman. It blows my mind uh, that two people have helped so many and have created this atmosphere that is really accepting of everyone. How many other rabbis that you know have been to jail? Rabbi Mark knows what I experienced. And for me, when I look at his eyes, when I hear every one of his words, any one of his gestures, I know where he comes from. And I know that he understands me at a level that nobody else uh, who hasn't experienced that understands me. Rabbi Mark is very, um, very blunt. He is kind and also impeccable with his word. And he doesn't take people's bullshit. He is highly abrasive, but at the same time, full of meaning and heart. Here is Harriet and me. Harriet's joy, and I'm Shalom motherfucker. He's just like you, in that the both of you are working towards a goal, connecting. Rabbi Mark and Harriet created a place that uh, saved my life. He is so totally committed to the truth. That there's no varnishing it, there's no twisting it, there's no turning it, there's no slicing it in half. And that's what gives him the power to heal addicts, but that's what makes folks very uncomfortable. We're used to politeness, which means that we're often used to half a truth, or a quarter of the truth, or a truth that's covered up. And Mark will not tolerate that. What you see is what you get. And it ain't pretty, and it's not polished, and it's messy. And a lot of people's lives were saved because I was messy. Rabbi Mark has been put in the world to save souls from addiction, criminality, and the brokenness that so many of us just fall into. A narrative began that we, we, well, Mark really, but me too, uh, were dangerous, that we were a liability to the organization. The narrative is Mark is so big a presence, nobody can work with him, and we have to find a way to, to get rid of him. I never thought I would ever retire. The whole um, story of Beit Shuva was, um, I'll be here at my desk till they carry me out, and, and that, 
was disrupted. The mono and our joint energy that created this is not the energy to sustain it in the world that now is. My whole identity for the last 35 years has been Beit Shuvah, and not just me, Harriet and Rabbi, Rabbi and Harriet, R and M. We were a unit, and Beit Shuvah was our child. In all nonprofit land, everybody lives in dread of founder syndrome. Founders become the enemy. I felt um, betrayed. I felt uh, um, bewildered, um, pissed off, and deeply wounded. Wounded to my core. You can't say asshole anymore. Rabbis can't say fuck from the bima. You can't. Uh, you have to use the right pronouns. It, it's not the world where where we could be the way we were when we created Beit Shuva. I regret some of the people that I probably pushed out. You know. Um, I regret decisions I made. They wrote the programs. They wrote the curriculum. They developed programs that nobody on the face of the earth could come up with. I think they are the, the, the lifeline, the very blood vessels that runs through the body of Bet Teshuva. No one can take away from us what we built and the legacy and all the people who we've helped who are devoted and recognize that, that that, that is forever. And my hope in making this film is to make that a reality, you know, that that legacy lives. Uh, my identity and my sense of purpose and my sense of meaning was so tied up for 35 years with being, um, you know, Mrs. Bechuva. Mr. and Mrs. Founder, the absence of that now, whether it's because of succession or pandemic or a mix of everything, um, has been very difficult for me. My knowledge of the future is we will figure it out. My hope is we get to keep doing what we do and what we love and do it together. The future is yet to reveal itself. I'm looking for another miracle. How about that? You all believed in our dream. You believed in the craziness that Harriet and I promoted. And you supported us. And you helped us grow. And there's no words that can ever express how grateful I am for that. Harriet, I've said it all over the years to you and about you. It's been the most difficult 18 months of our life. Together, we've come through them stronger more connected. I'm so grateful for who you are, what you are, and how you've helped me to be me. I leave a legacy of being an advocate for the soul of the program and pass on to the core clergy the mandate to find ways into the souls of each individual. I'm sorry to anyone and everyone who has been put off by my street way of being while not apologizing for who I am.